Well, a very worrying situation in India. India has recorded 81,466 new uh, coronavirus cases and 469 COVID deaths in the last 24 hours. This is the biggest one-day jump in active cases since the start of October last year, so the highest jump in six months' time. And it's also uh, being seen as one of the highest jumps anywhere in the world in daily cases. And uh, now the highest number of cases and deaths that have been reported in this year. Deaths are also the highest in seven Several months. Well, to talk more about the situation in India and why we're seeing this increase in COVID numbers, we're now joined by someone who's been watching the India story very, very closely, uh, Dr. Ashish Jha, Dean of Brown University School of Public Health. Thank you so much, uh, doctor, for joining us again on the show. A very worrying situation in India is emerging with massive uh, surge in cases. While variants have been discovered in India, so far the government has claimed that they are not responsible for the surge. Yeah, I think, first of all, I would say two things. First of all, there's not they're not doing enough surveillance to know. I mean, they should be doing a lot more genomic surveillance to know whether how much uh, widespread how widespread variants are. But also variants are the major source of the surge in cases across Europe, in the United States, in Brazil. So why would India be spared from this? Uh, so my best guess is that it is the major reason why we're seeing a surge in cases in India. And I also think that we need to be doing more genomic surveillance in India so we can actually track the variants. Right, Dr. Jha, so what about this uh, double mutated uh, virus that has been found? Cases of it have been found in Maharashtra. Uh, the government so far says there's no such thing as an Indian variant. Yeah, it's concerning. And I think we need a lot more information about what exactly those mutations are, uh, how well the vaccine works against it, uh, if, the, if one of the set of mutations is what we saw in South Africa, then there's a problem because Covishield does not work very well against the South Africa variant. And so we really need to understand how well the Indian vaccine, Covishield, but also Covaxin uh, works against these variants. So there's a lot of work to do, and it is not, an, it is not the right moment to downplay this. We should take this very seriously, uh, study these things, and really make a plan based on the data. Right, and now France has gone under, uh, you know, a lockdown of sorts again. There was a plan uh, in India for Maharashtra going under lockdown, but so far that's been ruled out. They will be going in for more restrictions. But who would have thought that a year later this would be the situation we would be thinking lockdown again? Yeah, this is part of the problem. You know, I had hoped that in the, when I had been looking at India data, you know, daily over the last many months, I was hoping that maybe... Uh, things would be on the right tr uh, trajectory for India for the rest of the pandemic. I think everybody was. The issue is that there's still many, many Indians who are vulnerable who have not yet been infected. And this is the pattern we're seeing around the world. So again, lockdowns are very extreme. You want to act earlier than that. You want to act the moment you start seeing cases increase. You don't want to deny it. You want to, and you can put in, put in much more mild restrictions initially try to limit indoor gatherings, try to push people to wear masks more effectively, do more testing. That's how you avoid lockdowns. But if you don't do them and you wait too long, then lockdown really becomes your only option, which is, of course, not a good option at all. And unfortunately, here in India, there's been a lot of mixed messaging uh, taking place. You know, you have the health ministry and again and again addressing press conferences, asking people to be careful, follow protocols, that the virus is still very much there. But then on the other hand, you have these massive election rallies being, uh, you know, uh, held by everyone in the government, by the opposition. You also have the Mahakum, uh, as you know, you're from India. So the Mahakum is taking place in Haridwar right now. Yeah, the gatherings are very concerning to me. Um, and the bottom line is that while we know that gatherings outside are generally safer, um, yeah. if you're really going to have a large gathering with people packed together as those gatherings usually are, everybody should be wearing a mask. That is, I think, very, very important. And that's not happening reliably in India. Um, and of course, uh, those outdoor gatherings then lead to indoor gatherings when people get together for meals and they get together uh, and, and, and in other ways. So I think it's really important that we limit indoor gatherings, work on mask wearing. Look, the virus isn't gone. This is a global pandemic. India is not immune to it. And even though it's been terrific to see India has had many good months, I am very worried that this second surge will be much worse than even the first surge. Uh, we've got to really avoid that.
Now, you know, our vaccine drive is continuing, but so far a big obstacle has been hesitancy uh, regarding the vaccine. There's also worry over news coming in from Europe and uh, Canada. Uh, in fact, Canada and Germany have once again restricted the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is Covishield here. What are your views on that? Yeah, so I think we do need to sort out those clotting issues, but they're very, very rare. I mean, this is the thing to, for people to understand is your chances of developing clotting problems is much, much higher if you get COVID than if you get the vaccine. So if you're worried about clotting, the vaccine is still much, much a safer way to go. Um, but overall, I think these vaccines remain relatively safe. I mean, not, not relatively safe, they are safe. Those, those are very rare events. And um, and we need to keep going on vaccinations. I, I would be very comfortable getting Covishield. I've, I have lots of family in India that I have encouraged to get Covishield. Uh, Covaxin, we need to see more data. We don't have that much information and data, so we need to see more. Vaccines are going to be how we're going to end this pandemic. And, and we really have to work on hesitancy and building up confidence. And so far in India, you know, so many months into the vaccination drive, we only have two vaccines in our kitty, Covaxin and Covishield. Many are questioning why we aren't getting more. There are other good vaccines out there. Uh, they, of course, have to go through the processes here, the bridging trials. Yeah, this is a huge problem right now because every country is taking whatever they're manufacturing and keeping it for themselves. And we're getting into a lot of problems with vaccine nationalism. Actually, India has done a good job of sharing it with its neighbors, uh, but... Uh, really, this is a huge problem. And what I have been arguing is that we need a global strategy. Again, a global pandemic does not come to an end because America vaccinates itself or Germany or India. Global pandemic comes to an end when the world gets vaccinated. And so all of us have to work much, much harder to expand vaccine supply, make sure people around the world, in India, in across the African continent, across Latin America, across the rest of Asia, get vaccinated, not just America and Western Europe. I think we're going to see more supply of vaccines in the upcoming months. But of course, I want to, I'm anxious to see it now, not have to wait more time. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jha, for joining us on the show once again. Now, India has joined a growing number of countries who are demanding a comprehensive investigation into the origins of the COVID outbreak in China as it backed the World Health Organization chief's proposal to deploy additional missions. Without naming China, India noted that WHO Director General Tedros had raised the issue of delays and difficulties in accessing raw data for the UN Health Agency's report on the origins of coronavirus. It also sought more timely and comprehensively sh data sharing for future investigations. Well, for more uh, on this entire controversy over the WHO COVID report, as well as uh, the issue of vaccine equity, we're now joined by Professor Lawrence Gostin, Director O'Neill Institute and Director at WHO Center on Global Health. Thank you so much. It's great to have you on the show once again. Uh, the first question is, of course, about this controversy over the WHO report. The U.S. and other countries have spoken out against uh, the WHO report on the origins of COVID and they've hit out at China as well. What is your view? You know, the report was very disappointing. I mean, the, the independent experts were um, world-class scientists, so I'm not blaming them. Um, but I think that China um, has uh, blocked a full and fair and rigorous inquiry into the origins of SARS-CoV-2. You know, we have to remember that this is a, an investigation that's taking place over a year after the initial outbreak. And it took a year to negotiate with China um, to uh, allow access to its soil and to Wuhan. Um, and even then, um, the uh, Chinese uh, did influence the report uh, and they uh, didn't provide full and transparent information um, and uh, samples to the team. Um, and so this is a great tragedy for humanity um, because, you know, we've suffered so much. You have in India, we have in the United States, and we deserve to know um, what uh, caused this, this uh, pandemic. Um, and the origins are extraordinarily important. So it is a sad day for humanity that we, we may never know um, what, what started the great COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. Now, the WHO has said uh, that this is an initial report and also that they haven't ruled out the lab leak theory, comple lab leak theory completely, though they do say it's unlikely. 
Um, I certainly think that the report is probably right, um, that this was a naturally occurring um, event in nature um, where a bat uh, transmitted a coronavirus to an intermediary animal and then to a human. But we don't have proof of that. Um, and the lab theory I do think is unlikely, I agree, um, but I don't think that there's been an, a thorough investigation. Literally, um, China just gave the WHO experts a tour for several hours of the lab. It wasn't a full and independent audit. Um, and the uh, Dr. Tedros and the team itself um, has a call for further investigation, um, but I can't see that ever happening. Um, if China delayed for a full year and didn't allow a, an initial thorough investigation, what would make us think that all of a sudden they would become transparent and accountable? No, I don't, I think this could be the end of the road. And even today, China has um, said that it wants to now focus on other countries around the world and it singled out Fort Detrick, a, a, a lab um, by the US uh, Defense Department. Um, but there's no evidence whatsoever um, that Fort Detrick is involved. And basically, uh, it's becoming ludicrous that um, China and the United States are pointing fingers at each other without any evidence whatsoever. And then the World Health Organization is caught in the middle. That's just no way to deal with a COVID. 19 pandemic. All right, well, let's shift focus now and talk about vaccine equity, which is, a, you know, a pet subject for you, and you've been advocating for it. How is the world faring so far? There have been allegations against uh, the U.S. for hoarding vaccines. No, it isn't. Um, it's, it's really, you know, quite disgraceful, and I agree with uh, Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, that this is a catastrophic moral failure or, or what the South African minister said, you know, a, a vaccine apartheid. You know, the US, the UK, Europe, Canada, other high income countries have pre purchased um, vaccines enough for twice or even three times of their population. They're hoarding the vaccines. At the same time, the European Union has slapped export controls over the AstraZeneca vaccine. India has recently done the same thing. But I think in India's case, it's more justified because you're a middle income country um, and you have a, a terrible um, epidemic on your hands. India is also, I think, the, the engine to vaccinate the entire world. Um, and so I give India very high marks. All right. Uh, you know, it's great that you say that. And yes, we have uh, exported a lot of vaccines to other countries, uh, though in India now that we've stopped that. Uh, but there has been uh, some amount of anger over the export of vaccines to other countries. Well, you know, India is a very difficult case um, because um, you 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 have this dual role of, a, you know, uh, the second most populous country in the world. Um, with a lot of poverty and a lot of disease. Um, and so I think that the claim from the Indian people um, to get a fair share of the vaccines is a legitimate claim, absolutely a legitimate claim, particularly the poor. Um, and uh, I would certainly like to see India return to exporting vaccines um, when as soon as it possibly can. Um, in my view, um, there are two ways out of this pandemic. Um, well, actually, there's only one way out, which is to vaccinate the world equitably. But there, the, there are two ways to ensure gr that scarcity doesn't interfere with vaccinating the world. One is, is that the U.S. Uh, and other high-income countries have to donate not just money, but vaccine doses um, to low and middle income countries. Um, but even if you uh, donate a dose, it saves a life, which is important. But if you transfer the technology so that the Serum Institute of India and, other, and, and in Brazil and other countries can produce the vaccines at scale themselves, um, then you save a country, then you save a world. 
And so what we have to do is uh, tear down intellectual property protection, uh, transfer the technology um, to India and other uh, uh, high manufacturing companies of, of great competence. And then we also need to provide financial and technical assistance to those countries to help them ramp up vaccine supply for the world. Um, it's not either or, it's not do we vaccinate the Indian population or vaccinate the world. We, sh we have the capacity to do both. Well, that's a great idea, Professor Gostin, but I still don't know if countries or companies will actually do that, actually transfer vaccine technology. I think they have to, you know, vaccinations are a global public good and we're in the middle of a pandemic. Ultimately, I think these companies are, are, are harming themselves because, you know, the world will not soon forget the selfishness of high income countries and the selfishness of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, they can do the right thing here and sharing the technology is absolutely the right thing. No one should be making a huge profit off of the hardship and death from this pandemic. I just refuse to, to accept um, that behavior. Uh, and I think uh, global leaders should feel the same way. All right, Professor Gostin, thank you so much for speaking to us here at NDTV and hope countries and companies hear uh, what you have said about the transfer of technology and how it will help save the world. Uh, time for us to slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll get you all the international COVID news. Stay with us.